Good morning, St. Mark. Good morning. So glad you guys are here. If you're a guest here with us, a warm welcome, a special welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Borman. If you're a first-time guest, welcome. I get to be the pastor of this place. I want to help you connect with St. Mark. If you'd like, uh, we, you, you're invited to grab one of these connection cards through the service, and you can fill it out. Uh, we have a prayer team that prays um, for you. If you have a prayer request, if you want to get a once-a-week email, you can put your email address on this thing and place it in the offering basket when it comes around. To kind of get you into what's happening here at St. Mark and worship these days, we're ministering to people in their suffering, not apart from it, but in it as it's happening. We're going to be talking about how God ministers to us in that. And we're going to be singing with uh, an opening song here that is, um, you can think of it as kind of like a punchback, victory when you feel defeated. And this is the perfect way for us to be thinking about as we've been moving through the book of Job, ministering to suffering, and we're beginning the climax in that. We're beginning to find the Lord's pinnacle in that. I want to invite you to join and sing it. It's a song called More Than Conquerors. Join as you feel comfortable.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Let us confess those times we embrace the comfort of despair and difficulty. God forgive us. For our self-centeredness in times of pain. God forgive us. For our loss of confidence in God's good plan in suffering. God forgive us. For trying to live by sight instead of by faith when in the fire. Christ forgive us. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. Let's praise him with this hymn of praise. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal, and righteous God, you revealed your divine word to teach us what we should do and what we should avoid. Strengthen and lead us by your Holy Spirit that we serve you in new obedience here until we come to complete holiness before you in that life to come. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. Please be seated. The Bible has many different angles on suffering. One of them here in 2 Timothy is that suffering is redemptive. That God can use it to help people. And I'll let you reflect on that here as Paul teaches us that here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Here it comes. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. The word of the Lord. At this time, uh, I want to invite you to please stand for the teaching of the Lord Jesus the sign of respect for him. Here, Jesus is going to teach us that wisdom and wisdom in suffering and trust, when suffering is happening, it belongs to him. A reading from Mark chapter 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Uh, You're invited to join and sing the, the sermon hymn. This is the hymn we've been getting used to and and getting into here in the sermon series, and I hope we can do it again today.
we have reached that part of the book of Job where finally here, the Lord is going to speak. Job has been speaking. His friends have been speaking. A lot of blathering, and we've talked about that. But here, the Lord is speaking. And it's quite, I encourage you to read it on your own. We're, we're not going to read the whole thing. It's quite lengthy. It's a long sermon. But here, we're going to pick up just a portion of it here in Job chapter 39. And you, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be tracking um, animal portraits. So here we go. Who let the wild donkey go free? Who untied its ropes? I gave it the waistline as its home, the salt flats as its habitat. It laughs at the commotion in the town. It does not hear a driver's shout. It ranges the hills for its pasture and searches for any green thing. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will it stay by your manger at night? Can you hold it with with the furrow, with a, to the furrow with the harness? Will it till the valleys behind you? Will you rely on it for its great strength? Will you leave your heavy work to it? Can you trust it to haul in your grain and bring it to your threshing floor? The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, though they cannot compare with the wings and feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly, as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. Yet when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. Do you give the horse its strength or clothe its neck with the flowing mane? Do you make it leap like a locust, striking terror with its proud snorting? It paws fiercely, rejoicing in its strength and charges into the fray. It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. It does not shy away from the sword. The quiver rattles against its side along with the flashing spear and lance. In frenzied excitement, it eats up the ground. It cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. At the blast of the trumpet, it snorts. Aha! It catches the scent of battle from afar, the shout of commanders and the battle cry. Does the hawk take flight? by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? It dwells on a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky crag is its foothold. From there it looks for food. Its eyes detect it from afar. Its young ones feast on blood and where the slain are, there it is. That's the word of the Lord. Now, we've been using Job 23.10 as a theme verse. And what Job said in Job Job 23.10 is he said, I'm coming forth as gold. What he he was saying is, I'm going to come out better than before. Not worse, I'm I'm coming out as better. Now, what I haven't, haven't told you yet, in the sermon series that I'm going to tell you now is that that, of course, is not inevitable. Let's use the metaphor. For Job is, here's the metaphor. Job is in a fire. And he says, when I get put in the fire, I'm coming, I'm coming forth as, as gold. I'm going to come out better, more refined, better, pure, better metal. But, of course, this is also true. Two things happen. Two possibilities exist when you go into the fire. One, you get better. Two, you get burned up. It is not inevitable that you get better. That's, that's why, you see, we have this proverb, and sometimes we use it foolishly. We say things like, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. That's only sometimes true. It's only sometimes true. 
Because we all know that what doesn't kill you can also make you worse. It can make you crabbier. It can make you more cynical. It can make you harder and worse to your own life in the world. It is not inevitable that you get better. What I'm trying to point out to you here is when Job says, when Job says, I'm coming out better than ever before, when he says that, that is an act of faith. That is him believing that the Lord is going to use the fire to make him better, that he's not going to get worse, that he's actually going to get better. And what I want to do is I want to help you towards that. I want this, what this whole book is about, but especially this, because here, this is not just Job talking, this is not just Job's friends talking, this is the Lord talking. The Lord himself is going to help you so that it, your suffering actually does make you better, it doesn't make you worse. And what I want to do is I want to encourage your faith toward that today. I want to encourage your faith while you're in it. While you're still suffering. Not after it's done and you're looking back on it. That's easy. Easy. I'm talking about while you're in it, while it's happening, while you're still being brought, brought down, while you're still in the hole. This is it. What this scripture does is it gives you three views for your faith to see. First of all, it's going to give you an outside view. Then it's going to give you an inside view. And then finally, we're going to see how it gives you an overview. Now, how does this all work? There, I did it. I asked you a question, just like God did. <laughs> the Lord was talking to Job, and he was peppering him. He was, he was grilling him. How about that for Fourth of July weekend? He was grilling him. All these questions, actually questions of a parti very particular variety. Often, they were questions that expected a no answer. Let me, let me give you just a little smattering of these. Will, Job, hey Job, will the wild ox consent to serve you? Uh, no, Lord. L Lord, no. <laughs> no, to be honest, Lord, my dog doesn't even listen to me that well. Not a, not a wild ox, not happening. Okay, how, how about this one then, Job? Do, do, do you give the horse its strength or clothe its neck with the flowing mane? Not, no, not exactly, Lord. Didn't, didn't do that either. Don't do that either, Lord. Okay, how about this one, Job? Does, does, the, does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? No, no God, I didn't. I didn't make the hawk. I didn't, I didn't do any of that. 70 questions. By my count, 70, 70 questions, starting in Job chapter 38, getting here in Job chapter 70, 70 questions. Job is getting grilled. And actually, and I, want, I want to take you on the tour because the Lord took him on a tour. He takes him on the tour. He, first of all, he takes him to the furthest reaches of the creation. He says, okay, Job, did you make the foundations of the earth? No, jo no Job, didn't, didn't do that. Didn't do that, Lord. Okay, how, how, about, how about the elements? You know, the elements of the earth, like the, the, like the land and the sea and all that stuff that's out there, sky. Did, did you, Job, did you, did you roll that all out? No, no, didn't do that, Lord. Didn't do that either. Okay, then, then Job, do you make it all function then? Like, do you, do you make it all function? Like, you, you know, as you can read it, all, the Lord has taken him on a tour of the meteorology of it, the, 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 the ecology of it. Do you, do you make, do you know, do you do the hail? And do you do the water? And do you do all that? No, no, no don't, don't do any of that stuff either. And then, finally, the, he's taken him on this tour. As the Lord has made the foundations of the earth. He's made everything in the earth. He's making all the stuff function in the earth. Then he gives the animal portraits. Do you take care of the wild donkey? No, no, don't do that. Can't control it at all. Can't help it at all. Okay, how about, how about the ibis and the rooster and stuff like that? Nope, nope, can't do that either. Can't do any of it. And that's it. Now, so sometimes, some, look, when you deal with scripture, some, sometimes what you need to do is not just pay attention to what, it's, what it says which is very obvious here. 
the Lord is the creator. He made everything. He runs everything. He runs everything. He tends, tends, cares for everything. What it says is obvious. Sometimes you have to pay attention to how it's said. Because what's happening here, what's happening here, Job is getting grilled, he's getting all these questions, is he's being made to see how small he is. Job, did you do that? Nope, don't do that. Job, can you control that? No, I can't control any of that. He's being seen. He's finally seeing how small he is. And then, by contrast, he's starting to see how big God is. He is being taken from a self-centered view of life to a God-centered view of life. Let me tell you why that's important in suffering. Do you know what happens in suffering? Of course you do. You've all suffered. Do you know what happens? Your world narrows. Your world constricts. Your world can get as small as you in your suffering in whatever hole you're in. And this is the prison break. We all need that. We all need the prison break. This, this is why. This is why. Have you ever thought about this? Why do we love going to the ocean? Why do we love going to the lake? Why do we love seeing the mountains? Why do we love all that stuff? Because it's the prison break. It is finally us seeing there is so much more. There is so much bigger. There is, we, and we are broken out from ourselves. Sometimes you just need a thunderstorm to crash over you to get broken out from the smallness of your own world. Because sometimes when you're in a hospital room, the world is as small as your hospital room. I've been there, I know. And sometimes when you're in a relationship struggle, the world, your world is as small as the relationship struggle that you're in. And God says, look out the window. Do you see that bird out there? Did you make it? Are you caring for it? No, God, I'm not. Oh, but you are, Lord. Or how about the Mississippi River? The Mississippi River, that money Mississippi River must be so big right now. Money Mississippi River goes all the way down to Louisiana Delta. Did you do that thing? Did you cut that thing? Did you do it? No, I didn't. I didn't do that, Lord. You did that, Lord. And the Grand Canyon, all that stuff. When you look outside and you get out, see, outside perspective, suddenly you see that the Lord is caring for everything, everywhere, even you. See, that's the first thing. You get this outside perspective. But then you also get an inside perspective, inside perspective. Now, we, picked up, we could have picked up any, anything in Job chapter 39, 38 and 39. I did chapter th- end of th- chapter 39. Why? Because that's where it gets, I think, gets really interesting. Because here, the Lord takes Job, interestingly enough, to the most inhospitable parts of the creation. Guys, the Lord takes Job on a tour of the worst stuff. If you're going on your 25th wedding anniversary, do the opposite. This is no man's land. This is where, where do we end up? Not in Hawaii. We're on the salt flats. That's where we went. We're in a battle scene. That's where we went. We're in the desert. That's where we went. We didn't go to Hawaii here. We went to the most inhospitable parts of the planet. And what happens, this is what's interesting, when we get to, when we get to these most inhospitable, no man's land, the most inhospitable parts of the planet, what do you see there? The exact opposite from what you expected. You expected to go there, and you expected to see all the salt strangling out all the life, because that's what salt does. You expected to go there, and you expected to see in the desert, desert, just sand. That's not what you see. You expect to go in the battle scene, and all you see are bodies laying around because that's what arrows do, and that's what swords do, and that's what happens in battle. Everything dies. No, what you see is you see stuff getting cared for. You actually see stuff that's alive. Actually, what you get is animal portrait after animal portrait after animal portrait. If I could do David Attenborough right now, I would.
Did you catch the wild donkey? So there are the wild donkeys out there on the salt flats, the wild donkeys out there on the salt flats, and what is it doing? It loves it out there. Did you notice that? The wild donkey loves it out there. It looks at all the commotion in the town, all that place where it could get a little food and a little manger or whatever, and it says, no, I'm not going in there. And actually what it did, did you notice that, is it laughed. I'm not coming into town. I don't want all that domestication. I'm staying out here on the salt flats. And then you get the ostrich. <laughs> we, had, we had an ostrich at, at the zoo that we were members at. I just, I, I always feel, oh, true confession. I've always felt bad for ostriches. I think they're a really goofy bird. I just do. I, I actually think the Lord thinks it's a goofy bird too. Did you notice that the bird that the bird, the Lord, pokes fun at the ostrich. I actually think that's what he's doing. Because the Lord goes, did you catch, did you, the Lord goes, look at its wings. It flaps its wings joyfully. And that makes me laugh. Because everybody knows that the ostrich doesn't fly. It's, it's got wings. It's a ridiculous bird. Isn't it a ridiculous bird? It, in fact, it's, it's such a ridiculous bird. The, the only bird, that, you know, even a penguin, right? Even a penguin. You'd think those wings are pretty useless, but they're really good in the water. But an ostrich has wings for nothing. It's a ridiculous bird. It's just ridiculous. In fact, in the ancient world, and you can see the Lord's poking fun in his own creation. He says, look at this. Look at this foolish bird. You know, it lays its eggs, and then it just runs off. It's such a foolish bird. You know, and then the eggs get crushed, and the, the animals come, and the predators eat the eggs and stuff like that. Such a foolish bird. And yet... Doesn't that remind you of suffering? It looks so dumb. It looks so foolish. It looks like wings that don't do anything. But when you see that bird run, huh, <laughs> it laughs. <laughs> That's what the Lord said. It laughs at horse and rider. And then you get a war horse. And that thing loves it. I mean, it comes alive when it goes into battle. You notice that. Like, this is a real battle scene. There's arrows flashing and there's trumpets going and all of a sudden there's this line that starts rushing towards the battle and the horse loves it. It loves it so much that when the trumpet goes off for the battle, the horse laughs at danger. What we're seeing is that in the most inhospitable parts of life, most inhospitable parts of the planet, there, right there, the Lord not only gives life, he gives laughter. <laughs> okay, let me at that for a second. Just, just let me at that. Do you, do you realize something about the creation? The Lord wants so much more than things to work. You realize that? He wants so much more things, more than for things to function in your life. And like, I, I want to quote Jesus. And I'm going to quote Jesus. <laughs> I have come, the Lord Jesus said, I have come to give that you might have life. Life to the full. He wants you to do so much more than function. He wants his entire creation to dance, to joy, to enjoy, to laugh. We're, in, we're talking about the inside, the inside of suffering. What the Lord wants you to have is faith. Not after you're through the morning, not after you're through the trauma, during it. You know, now let me quote another part of the Bible. Another part of the Bible, what does the Apostle Paul say in Romans 5? He says, we glory when in our sufferings. 
not apart from, not afterwards, during and in and when. How, how do we do that? How do we do that? With an inside, here's the insider view. When is, it, when is a wild donkey a wild donkey? On the sod flats, not away from it. When is a war horse a real war horse? In the war, not apart from it. And when are you becoming more you during your suffering, in your suffering, not apart from it? This is, let, me, let me put this another way. God is clearly showing you here that in your life he is more interested in your character than in your comfort. He is more interested in your holiness than in your happiness. And he is more interested in making you golden than giving you lots of gold. I was, I, I've got all these examples in my head. It was just, it was one of those weeks. But I'll give you this one. I was on a webinar listening to this former pastor, and he has been through it. Brilliant mind. But he said, in my suffering, that's when God got to me. It was when everything fell apart in my life that fi God finally was able to change me. See, it wasn't a part, it was during. And what ended up happening is that God gave a, a man with a brilliant mind a brilliant character to match. The insider, the, this is the inside view. When you're suffering... God is making you more golden. He's changing you. He's working on you. And suffering breaks you open to make it possible. But there's one last sight. I want to give it to you here. There's one last sight. And it's very properly an overview. It's going to ground you. It's going to, here's the guarantee. This is, this, everything that I'm saying is true. Here's the overview. And you know it's an overview because all of a sudden we get avian bird portraits. <laughs> you give, I'll give you one. It's an overview. It's hawks, they look down, right? Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom? So this is what's happening. Uh, we've come out of a battle scene, right? That was the last animal portrait. Ant War horse, we were in battle. All of a sudden we're vaulted up with the birds, and we're beginning to look down on it. We're looking down on the suffering. We're looking down on the, on the war scene, the battle scene. We're looking down on the pain. We're getting an overview, and we're getting a very special overview. Here, you, you, get, you get a trigger word, because what it says, the Lord says, by your wisdom, this is wisdom literature. The Lord is about to give you something big, something important, and so we're getting an overview with the birds. And so we close with a portrait of an eagle. Now, I didn't plan that. I honestly didn't. I'm not that smart. I didn't plan it. It's 4th of July weekend. It just happened that we're talking, I'm just saying, we're talking about eagles. And here's what it says. This is what the Lord says, closing verse, right here, of the Lord's speech. There's carnage, we're in the war. Here's what it says, little eaglets. It's young ones feast on blood and where the slain are, there it is. Now that's provocative. You get this image, you get these eagles, they're eating, they're eating dead flesh, they're eating blood. Now, this, this can be a reminder on, on 4th of July weekend that it was Benjamin Franklin who said we should not have the eagle as a national symbol. We shouldn't do that. It's an immoral bird. Maybe some of you know that. It's an immoral bird. This, this is why. But he didn't win. He didn't win out. Obviously, we have an eagle. And for good reason. For good reason. The eagle in history has always been a very powerful symbol. Actually, in the Bible, it's been a very powerful symbol. In fact, it comes up very famously in Isaiah chapter 40. And there, the Lord says, I'm going to carry you on eagles' wings. Actually, back in the 90s, when I was a kid, there was a very popular hymn 
called on eagle's wings. Eagle's wings, based on Isaiah chapter 40. But then, maybe you didn't know this, it actually, this image of an eagle in the Bible, it goes back even further. It goes back even further because what, interestingly enough and importantly enough, the image of the eagle, it goes all the way back to that time in world history when God's people were suffering the most. Their little baby boys were getting murdered. See, they, they were there in Egypt. They were massively oppressed people. And there in the Exodus, that's what it's called, God said this, I brought you out and I quote, carried you on eagles' wings. And wonder of wonders, what we get here is an eagle-eye view of life where we look down and this is what we notice. God can make it. I'm going to say this very carefully. God can make it where even a bloody mess can bring you new life. That's what it just said. Blood and death can bring you brand new life. Now, uh, I don't have to push on that that hard, do I? In a place like this? I don't, have to, I don't have to push on that too hard to point out to you that, that that is not just a truth, that is the truth. That is, in fact, the gospel itself. The Lord himself came down into no man's land. He comes down into our salt flats. He came down, he came down in a place where there shouldn't be life anymore. He came, to, he came down into the desert. He came down into all of it. And what did he do? He died a suffering, bloody death. More suffering than anybody's ever suffered. More suffering than anybody ever will suffer. And what comes out of it? His blood is our new life. His resurrection is the defeat of death and blood everywhere in the resurrection from the dead. That's what God does. That's what God did in Jesus Christ. He took the blood and he saved you with it. It's your new life. And that's the view, see? That's the ending view. As you, look, you can look back and say, look, look, look around. The Lord is feeding and caring for so much in the creation, all of it. And he doesn't even need your help. Look around. He's caring for you too. Get busted out of that small place that you're in. Look around. Don't, don't you see that God can make it so that, so that the salt flats of your life is not just a place that you want to get out of, but, but look, God is changing you. He's making you better. Right there is the place where he wants you to be to cause you to thrive and laugh in ways you never have before. And the proof of that is that God can take death and blood and change it into new life. Right now, it is your invitation to believe that. Before things get fixed, while you're sti still being taken apart, that he's going to make you into a whole new hole. To take it on faith that you're coming out of this better than ever. Let's pray for that. Lord, you, here you've given us this tour of your creative power. Your creative power that enters into nothingness, that enters into salt flats, that enters into even blood and death to bring new life. 
raise our eyes to the cross today that we might have that eagle eye view of life. And when we struggle, carry us on your back like little eaglets on eagle wings. Jesus, in your great name I pray. Amen. Please stand and let's confess our faith this morning using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The offering plates uh, will be coming around, and this would be a perfect chance to take one of those connection cards, and if you're willing to fill it out, um, fill it out and place it in the offering baskets as they come along. Please stand for prayer. It's a special time for us to um, pray for our country here on 4th of July weekend. And you can find everything you need for that prayer um, up on our screen or in our bulletins. Holy Father, God of mercy, we thank you for the gift of this country to us. Look with compassion upon this land and grant to us civil peace. We cherish the right to express disappointment or disagreement publicly. 
but grant grace to those who do so always to speak with respect and reason. Remove from all hearts hatred, suspicion, fear, and prejudice. Help us to explain our neighbor's actions in the kindest way and use your church to be an agent of peaceful and reasoned discourse in this time. Grant us unity as a nation, delighting in the rule of law and not of men. Drive from us the spirit of sedition and rebellion and help all our citizens to honor our government officials, to pray for them and to hold them accountable as servants of the common good. Lord God, ruler of the nations, we commend our nation and its leaders to your care. Bless all officials who serve us in national, state, and local government. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Impress on all who are in authority the sacredness of the responsibility you have placed upon them. Give them the gifts required for leadership, wisdom to make decisions that will bring order and justice to our society, and compassion for the suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Purge our land from dishonesty and corruption. Teach us to honor all civil authorities as your representatives. Through stable government, provide throughout our land an atmosphere in which your church can do its work in peace. Lord, in your mercy. Son of God, eternal Savior, source of life and truth and grace, word made flesh whose birth among us, hallows all our human race. You are head who throned in glory, for your own will ever plead. Fill us with your love and pity. Heal our wrongs and help our need. And we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We've got a closing song here and uh, a beautiful song that gives us so much hope. Um, feel free to join us if you feel comfortable.
Thanks again for all of you being here um, this 4th of July weekend. A special welcome to our guests. There's a bunch of stuff coming up at St. Mark, and you can see it all in the announcements here in the back of the bulletin. One that's really actionable already today is uh, there is a paint and sip ladies fellowship event, and uh, the deadline for signing up for that was extended to today. So if, you, if you're a lady here and you want to be involved in that paint and sip event, you can speak to Emily Holtzeder. She's right here, and um, you can still get involved with that today. Here's some stuff that's coming up later this month. You can read about, read about how to get in contact, people to get involved. July 11th, there's a men's dinner. July 21st, there's a teen fellowship event. July 31st, there's a St. Mark's Summer Nights event. And um, another ladies thing, there's a, a women's small group um, that's supporting mothers. And that's going to be continuing this week as well. So you can read about that in the bulletin as well if you want to get involved. One last thing is um, uh, we're still kicking off our Because Jesus uh, campaign, which is this is just us remembering that Jesus wants us to love other people with him. And there's a couple things I want. One, you can pray because canvassing is going to be there's a, we have a team. And of up to 13 people who are going to be going, we're actually going to be going out and talking to people. So if you, you could participate in that just by praying for us who are going out. And the second piece of it is that we're asking everybody here to um, do invites. And uh, we've, we've been saying all along here that there's three different ways. One, you can invite people to um, a St. Mark event, a worship event. You could even invite them to a men's night or a women's night or something like that. And um, just bring them along and start to get people engaged in the community here. And that's the first one. The second one is to invite people to talk to the pastor. So and we talked about that one last week. Maybe you, somebody has significant spiritual questions or they're in crisis or something like that. We have business cards out in the Waltham Center. You can grab one of those guys. Or if you've already got my contact, just text it over to them. And I love, I love talking to people. I really want to try to help people. And then finally... We're asking people just to have spiritual conversations in your life with people. So maybe you have a friend or a spouse. You can have a spiritual conversation with them about Jesus. And I, first, I'm going to go real quick. But in the past couple weeks, we did a couple interviews. I thought you want to, well, maybe you don't want to hear from me. You, I already gave you a full sermon. But you're going to hear from me. And I'm going to give you, first of all, just three tips as you have a spiritual conversation, three encouragements. And I'll go really fast, I promise. The first is... It's, listen, sometimes we just want to talk so fast. What if you ask a question, just listen? And maybe that's all you do the first time, is you just listen to somebody. What's going on in their life? What's their question? What's their pain? And just listen to them. And then you can go and think about it and pray on it. How, you, how can you maybe speak back in a way that's helpful and healing? So that's the first is listen. Two, take the pressure off. I know we all want to have the right answers and we want to say the right thing. You know everybody in here knows enough about Jesus 
to say something simple. Even if it's, I, I know that Jesus loves me, that gives, that gives me confidence in that moment. You've got enough. You all have enough um, with the Holy Spirit inside you and his word. So take the pressure off. You don't have to have a perfect answer or something like that. Um, and then finally, uh, and thirdly, just love somebody in your heart. Listen to them and respond to them with great love because they have a spiritual need and you have a chance in a moment to help them even as you have been helped with your spiritual needs. And here's three encouragements. I, was that fast? I'm going to try to go fast. One is when you do this, there's going to be an awkward moment. Embrace it. Embrace the awkward. Because on the other side of that awkward, it's often the breakthrough. Do you realize that? On the other side of, of you know, you got to break the glass ceiling or whatever. Embrace the awkward. Get to the other side of it. There's something awesome that's there. The second thing is, it works. It actually works. When you have spiritual conversations with somebody in a loving, gentle manner, you plant seeds. And what I notice about seeds this time of year is they come up through concrete. I don't know if you notice that. But they come, it works. It actually works. And then the third thing is that this is my own experience I'm sharing with you. It is actually a joyful thing. Like when you share what's beating at the center of your heart and you have a conversation with that about somebody, you're, you think that you're going to be scared and it's going to be awful and all that stuff. And sometimes there is a little bit of that. But often the more predominant experience is it's awesome. You actually experience joy. Now here's one last thing. Some of you got an email earlier this week. And if you didn't, you can ask me about it after church. And, but if, if you did, then um, you know that sometimes when you, have, when you want to have a spiritual conversation with somebody and you want to earnestly help somebody, it doesn't always go the way you want it to. <laughs> it doesn't. But when things like this happen, it is a reminder that often that person's not the enemy. No, the enemy is actually the enemy. And that person's a person to love. And we're not going to let evil, we're not going to let anything else stop us from doing that. We're just going to keep loving people the way we're called to do it. All right, happy Fourth of July weekend. Good to see everybody. Thanks for hanging with me. And um, come back again soon. <laughs>